Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Not Your Mama's Podcast. Today's special guest is Brianna. She is the founder of Conscious Mommy, which helps parents transform their parenting experience to a more stress be stress free and calmer experience. Brianna offers coaching plus workshops to help you feel more confident and at ease in your parenting experience. Welcome to the show. It's such an honor to have you on. Thank you for having me, Christina. Such a pleasure to be here. Yeah. So tell me a little bit more about your background and, and you know how you got to where you are today. Sure. Um, I'll be brief about it. So I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist in California, and I'm a state endorsed infant family and early childhood mental health specialist, as well as a perinatal mental health specialist. I have been working with families with very young children um, and new moms for um, over a decade now. And um, I really have just kind of stepped into conscious parenting, I would say even long before I became a mom myself. Um, It was around 18 years old is when I noticed that the people that I was going to college with, I'm from a very small town outside of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. And then I went to school in New York City. I went to NYU. And it was actually in meeting those, meeting new friends and hearing about their family and their upbringing that really shocked me to my core because I had just assumed everybody had experienced a lot of chaos and violence and difficulty and extreme stress in their upbringing. And to learn that that there were people raised not like that was just truly shocking for me. And it, I ended up going to therapy time, which was so incredibly healing and life changing and um, really revealed for me a lot of uh, wounds that I truly didn't even know that I had. And when I had made the decision to become a therapist myself, I just kind of naturally found myself, even before I was a mother, I naturally found myself working with families with very young children and really relating to families going through a lot of trauma, a lot of dysfunction, a lot of stress, and not knowing how to navigate it. It was almost like becoming Coming, like being the wounded healer, right? Like having my own wounds, but finding a way to heal on my own and then bring that healing on to other people. And um, it just seems so natural to want to focus with very young children and their parents. Um, I really believe in relationships. So all of my work is, is relationship heavy. I am Mm -hmm. focused on how do we cultivate a real sense of deep connection and and honesty and trust right from the very beginning. Um, We can certainly do it at any stage of our parenting journey, but if we're starting off when we're very young in this connected way with our children and really checking our expectations at the door, checking our own traumas and wounds and projections at the door and showing up authentically for our children and allowing our children to show up as their authentic, true, beautiful, unabashed selves. If we can come to a place and really be present with that, I think that we're going to change the world in totally. doing that. So how would you define like conscious parenting to someone who is is unfamiliar with that term? So I would define conscious parenting as um, parenting that that is about the parents, raising our own sense of self-awareness, understanding why we are the way we are. Mm -hmm. So making sense of our own triggers, making sense of our own reactive patterns, understanding how our past influences how we show up for these children, I would say Mm -hmm. is the primary goal of conscious parenting. Um, It's less actually about strategies and tips and tricks to get the children to do whatever it is that we want them to do. Yeah. Um, But it's really more about staying in conscious connection with ourselves and then that kind of organically spilling over to being in conscious connection with the children. Yeah. And I agree. I think an early age, like the younger, the the better to, to try to get that connection. I mean, you know, like you said, it really is never too late to work on that, but you know, it's always great to start young because they are so um, moldable and shapeable, um, especially in how we treat them. And yeah. um, 
and trying to keep their um, their angelic happiness, you know, intact, you know, so we don't shatter their, you know, who they're supposed to be, you know. Right. I mean, the world is going to have its way with our kids. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's going to, it's going to shame them. It's going to blame them. It's going to be harsh on them. It's going to be punitive at times. So when we're really thinking about creating and cultivating a relationship where even when the world is hard, you can come back here and you can expect to be seen. Mm -hmm. You can expect to be heard you can expect to be to feel love for who it is you are you can expect connection now i can't always promise you that i'm going to know how to perfectly connect with you or i'm going to know how to perfectly understand you but what you know is reasonable is that we're going to work together to find a way to cultivate that for you Mm -hmm. and the way that we really do that as parents is by doing that for ourselves first so Mm -hmm. understanding what our primary triggers are, what our primary, what our default belief system or core belief is, right? Is it that I'm not lovable? Is it that I'm not good enough? Is it that no one will only want to be with me unless I'm perfect? Is it that, you know, I'm a failure? I'm just a big mistake. Mm -hmm. What is the core belief that we carry with us when we are hurt or wounded in some way? And how can we give that little parts of ourselves, all the grace and all the compassion and really see and hear and understand that so that we do not pass that same projection, that same Mm -hmm. belief onto the child. If we are conscious, we will not pass it because we'll be aware of it. We'll account for it and we will keep it to ourselves. It's our own baggage, if you will. Yeah. If we're not aware of it, we will unconsciously pass it. And then we'll find ourselves right back in that shame loop, in that guilt loop of, oh, I can't believe I did that. I promised myself I would not be like my own parent. And here I am acting just like them and I can't make it stop. That's the main reason why people come to see me in therapy. They come when their children are three, four, and five and find themselves acting out these patterns that mm-hmm. they so desperately wish they could stop acting out. Yeah. And we have to go through this whole process that I'm describing for you for them to be able to actually shift the all the dynamic and all the energy in the home. And I think when parents understand that as parents, we are the agents of change. Mm-hmm. It's not about getting kids to change. Children are not going to change. They will not change themselves for us. They will not and they cannot. They they simply do not have the brain structure to do it, right? They they cannot. It is up to us to make the adjustments. It is up to us to change. And that is where I think a lot of us really resist, maybe because we didn't have parents change themselves for us. We had parents who forced us to change and acquiesce to them. Mm -hmm. And so- A lot of parents now are identifying as cycle breakers, people who are changing the way they are parenting dramatically Mm -hmm. so that they can have maybe a chance at just letting these children live a life that is free from our projections and free from our expectations for them. Totally. So like, what's your philosophy though on... Like, let's say you have like a really bossy, demanding toddler. Um, and so the, like, for me, it's like, I try to be nice, you know, okay, calm down, calm down. And then I like kind of explode and I get a little mean. Sometimes I, I end up apologizing right. and, you know, it's my own issue, you know, like I lose my patience and things like that. Like, what are some things that you can help with parents to not lose their shit? <laughs> right. So excellent. So first of all, uh, referring to a toddler in those ways, bossy, you know, etc., automatically is going to set us up to be fighters, isn't it? Right. Because yeah. if I feel like I am fighting with my young child, of course, I'm going to automatically go into this relationship more triggered. So the first practical step we want to do is actually see our children with less judgment 
And, and if that means we have to choose different words, oh, she's really assertive. She knows what she wants. She is very clear and really strong about getting what it is that she wants or whatever kind of words it is that don't feel so loaded for yeah. you. That's the first step. The second step is to ask ourselves, why is it so triggering for me to have a bossy, demanding child? Why does that trigger me so much? So we want to understand why, because mm -hmm. it's, it's there, this is not happening in a vacuum. It's not about the child. That's what exactly. I'm, that's what I'm trying to teach us. Yeah. It's not because there's something wrong with this child being bossy and demanding. She's three. Of course she's bossy. <laughs> You're, that's yeah the they only have like this sure, much knowledge of like a full circle of the world you know what I mean correct it's just how they exist in the world because she is three and that is what it means to be three so why is it so difficult for me almost always it's it has to do with our own need for control especially with a bossy or demanding child these children are very controlling and we human beings naturally resist feeling controlled someone else we do not like it and we will we will act we'll try to fix which is what which is the just what you were describing oh, i'll try yeah. to be nice I'll try to help her get so we try to fix it but then when we realize that we can't fix it which is just another way of controlling we explode and we fight back which is another way of controlling so we're unable to resist our urge to control the children because we haven't dealt with our own need for control so then we have to do an inventory in our lives. Where do I realistically have control? I cannot control my child. It's not my domain. My ch child has to learn how to be in charge of their own body. I can control myself. Mm -hmm. So what do I need to practice to control myself more? What do I need? Do I need less playtime with my child? Because I need more playtime with myself so yeah. that I actually have more expansive space to be able to stay present with my feisty three-year-old and not get wrapped up in it but i can yeah. just stay present and be aware oh look at her i see what's going on with her she needs a little bit of control and now i know that because she triggers my need for control yeah how do i collaborate with this child give her a little bit of control maybe she needs a little bit more responsibility and so we both win that's really yeah. the my, my method. That's my approach. That's great. No, that's, that's so beautiful. Cause we really do need to look at ourselves on the inside and kind of, I mean, yeah. And I kind of, I almost feel bad now that I said that he's bossy, like, because he, he isn't, he is assertive. He knows what he wants, you know, but, but listen, even here, hear this. I feel bad now that I said he's bossy. So there's an inner, there's an inner child belief there. Yeah. I feel bad because why do you feel bad? Because I like n gave him such a loaded word, like, um, make it about you. I feel bad because I, I'm bossy. Ah, I and do have a little bit I, of control issues. You know what I mean? I do like to be in control. I mean, it really was like, Oh damn. Like, yeah. Like it, it, it is and my own message what messages about being controlling and being bossy did you receive as a child? Well, um, I mean, a little bit. I mean, I guess I wasn't like super controlled, but, I, you know, I remember sometimes, um, you know, like being at the dinner table or something like that and like being made fun of for something or, you know, I don't know. I, I don't want to have a whole therapy session up on here. <laughs> We're not having a therapy session, but I'm trying to bring you to understand that I feel bad. I feel bad. It makes me feel bad. I feel well, like I'm a I bad always mom. sometimes feel bad about myself, you know, and I'm always saying sorry right. for things, you right. know, like, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I did that when I really don't need to apologize for anything, you know? So I do say sorry a lot. Um, right. And I noticed though that my son too, like says sorry a lot too. Like he's picking up my, my traits of the things that I say, like I accidentally like, you know, so, but no, it makes total sense. <laughs> yes. So the point is, is that even when we like guilt trip ourselves, like, oh my gosh, I feel, I feel so bad that I even called him that we're guilt tripping ourselves because we have an expectation that we shouldn't do that. 
that a, that a good mom always has the perfect words to describe her child. And therefore, because I didn't have the perfect world, I'm a bad mom, I'm a failure. So it goes right back to those inner child core beliefs that I was describing earlier, that it that lives there. It lives within all of us. Totally. We all have these these ideas and these beliefs that were shaped not just by one experience, but by a multitude of repeated experiences. And when we don't bring them into our conscious awareness, we pass them along to the child and we make the child do the work for us. But when we bring these things into our conscious awareness, I first of all, my child doesn't have to do the work for me. And second of all, I don't really need to, I don't need tips and tricks anymore because I'm aware of myself and mm -hmm. I'm able to be present to what is happening in the moment for both of us. Yeah. This is what being in relationship is all about. It's being able to realize, oh, whoa, I see my part in it. I see why I maybe triggered my child. I, I called, I called him bossy to his face. Maybe yeah. I made him feel bad, right? Maybe I totally. made him feel bad. Oh, okay. I see my part. Now I'm going to take accountability for my part and I'm going to keep going and I'm going to try again. That's why I love this, this idea, this theory, because it's so not shaming. It's so not guilt tripping. It really just invites us to understand ourselves more exactly. Yeah, and then keep moving forward, you know? Totally. I mean, I feel like I I'm even understanding myself more in just the little time that we've been talking. Um, yeah. And one of the videos I saw <clears throat> that you did was about for interrupting, you know, mm -hmm. um, you know, hold your thoughts. Um, what other things? Yeah. Hold your thoughts. Um, and I tried doing that with, with my son, um, but it didn't work. <laughs> I think it obviously has to be like a continuing thing, but what other advice do you have like to help parents with, with those types of um, like situations, yeah. like where there's no boundaries or things like that. Yeah. I mean, that's a really, that's a really general question. So it yeah. might be hard for me to give some specific advice, but what I can say is these things like hold your thought doesn't work if we're, if we haven't done the pre-work that oh. I just described. Okay. So hold your thought is not going to be effective. This is why I keep one of my main messages on my Instagram is try not to be beguiled by tips and tricks and strategies because they will always fall flat when we're not prioritizing understanding ourselves and connecting with the child. That is the pre-rec work, right? Yeah. Hold your thought comes out of... I have a deep understanding of my child's nervous system. I have a deep understanding of my own nervous system. I know how much, how easy it is for my child to wear me down, right? And I am yeah. breathing through that. And I'm teaching my child along the way yeah. what it is that I need them to do. So mm -hmm. generally speaking, when it comes to helping our children, what I, what I find most parents struggle with are expectations that are way too high for the child in front of them. Yeah. Okay. So for example, really energetic, impulsive, hyperactive four-year-old who is just now being taught how to hold their thought is going to have a lot harder of a time learning that skill yeah. because they have all other kinds of factors that influence them. Mm -hmm. So for that child, I'm going to tailor my approach. I'm going to really stop myself and have conversation and maybe do a lot of role playing with the child. Okay. Now let's pretend here's little Dolly, Susie Dolly, and she really wants mommy's attention. Mommy, 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 mommy. What do we think Dolly should try to do? And I'm going to ask that four-year-old to give me and give me some ideas of what Dolly should do. Okay. So perfect. that I'm creating a collaborative experience between me and my child, and using play as a way to teach them is a brilliant, brilliant way to help impart message to our children. If my child is struggling with hitting, um, I want to understand the need behind it. 
is my child hitting out of anger? Are they hitting out of sensory dysregulation? Is my child not getting enough energy out in other parts of their lives and they need more input? Am I distracted and I'm not really present with my child? Children are more likely to physically act out when we're absorbed by our phones, for example. Yeah. yeah. I have to understand what is going on beneath the surface mm -hmm. before I just try to curb the behavior. Totally. So if you read like Dr. Mona Delahook's work, she talks so so much about going beyond the behaviors and seeing underneath seeing underneath the behavior the real need that children have and almost always it's a need for connection it's a need to be understood and it's a need for skills they don't have the skills mm -hmm. so a kiddo who's hitting i want to get the needs met and then i want to be really clear with my boundaries honey i can't let you hit hitting is not the way to be able to get what you want yeah Let's find another way, sweetheart. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And like distract them, like could do something else for them. Like, what do you, what would you, um, what do you like believe in like timeouts and stuff like that? Is that, you know what I mean? I mean, I know it's all about like the parent and stuff like that, but like, what's just like your philosophy on like parenting in general? Like, are you, is it more like soft parenting or is it just, it's all structured based on like, our parents, the parents' needs and stuff like that? Um, that's a good question. So, uh, you know, when, when we really understand the child's needs, we have no reason for timeouts. We yeah. have no reason for forced consequences. Now, there are, you know, natural consequences. You, you went outside and didn't bring your rain boots and now your feet are wet, yeah. right? Like. So there are natural consequences, but like there's really no need for us to be punitive or, um, you know, put children in isolating situations um, in order to teach them a lesson. Okay. Uh, so my, my primary parenting philosophy is we are prioritizing the connection between the child and the parent at all times because uh, that's the most important thing for this child. We know that children learn everything in the context of relationships, everything. Yeah. They don't learn things outside of the context of relationships. Therefore, when we are teaching our children social regulation, emotional regulation, behavioral regulation, we are teaching them that within the context of the relationship, whether we like it or not, right? If we, if we say, well, timeouts work, I'm going to put my kid in timeout. We are teaching our child that relationally, when you are feeling strongly, you need to be by yourself. Nobody wants to be around you. Mm -hmm. And we cannot be surprised then when that child becomes an adult and they have an inner core belief that they are not lovable when they're feeling strongly and that they must be perfect in order to be lovable, in order for people to want to be around them. We cannot be surprised that this is the conclusion because young children are very egocentric. They are very they believe that everything that happens to them is what's happening in the world. Yeah. They cannot separate and see that mom has her own needs. Mom is having a hard day. Dad had a hard day at work. Yeah. They're not capable of, of seeing that. Yeah. And so it doesn't really support the goal of the relationship. What I think is more important is that we ask ourselves, why do I want to be punitive right now? What is that about for me? And then we ask ourselves, what skill is my child missing that I need to teach them? Yeah. And okay. then we have to get down with teaching them over and over and over again. I tell parents all the time, you're going to put in the work, okay? You're going to put in the work when they're young and teach them obsessively over and over and over again, as I'm describing. Or you're going to put in the work when they're older and you're going to be dealing with them lashing out at you, rejecting you, pushing you away, not wanting to be connected with you. And you're going to feel like you have no understanding of what's going on in their world and in their life. Yeah. So you're going to put in the work either way. Mm -hmm. It's hard work. Both, both ends of what I'm describing yeah. are very hard work. It's mm -hmm. just that 
what I'm what I'm trying to teach parents is not just theoretical, rooted in science. This is what this is everything I learned in my infant mental health training. Yeah. It is a neuro relational framework. We understand what is going on in the neurobiology of the child, and we understand what's happening in the child parent relationship. And when we really help parents understand these two fundamental things, we really do create an environment where I can't promise you it will be stress free. I can't promise you it will be chaos free. Yeah. But I can promise you that despite the stress and despite the chaos, there will still be deep connection. Mm hmm. Yeah, totally. Yeah, I'm really it's really opening up my mind um, on how to parent better, to be honest with you. Um I would love to like sign up for one of your workshops. <laughs> you definitely should. I think that my new one coming up in April, the let go of your triggers is going to be a really good one. And then my replay, um, let go of your inner control freak will be very supportive for you. Yeah, and then I, I like, have I another one. one. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's a really good one. And then I have um, consciously managing meltdowns, which is, you know, specific for parents dealing with big feelings and tantrums and really just needing, uh, you know, needing to know how to navigate feelings without squashing them, yeah. without isolating yeah. them in a way that is really supportive for exactly what I'm talking about, the child's neurobiology, as well as our relationship with our children. Yeah, it's so important. It is so important. I know because I, I always I'm trying to navigate. I try different things. I mean, my son's amazing and he's great and I love his independent personality, you know, I wouldn't want him any other way. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm always trying to be the best I can be because I don't want to squash or diminish, you know, the feeling of like, oh, okay, when I act out like this, like I'm not loved or like, it's not okay to show emotion because it totally is okay to show emotion. And we want to do it in a healthy and, and loving way. Um, so I think, right. yeah. Um, and so for the audience listening, if anyone is interested, I have all the links down below um, so you can contact Brianna. I mean, I think it's amazing. Everyone can work on their own baggage because we are not perfect and we all have triggers. That's for sure. Um, yep. So before we end, I do have four questions that I ask every audience member. And the first question is who and what inspires you? I would say uh, my mom inspires me. And uh, my, my children inspire me the most. They are, my mom is what is who gave me all the material that I, that I work with and gave me so much reason to reflect and make sense of her and my life. And my children give me a uh, purpose to carry this work out, you know, into the community and into the world the best way that I can. Yeah. No, I can totally like sense you are just amazing. Like you just exude just like so much knowledge. And I mean, you're very impressive. Um, so the second question is, what is something you wished you knew when you were younger? I wish I knew that I was enough as I am. Yeah. And that it is okay to have boundaries. Those were things I was never, um, never given guidance around. And now as an adult, I'm really finding myself stepping into that. And it is incredibly powerful to believe, really believe that you are enough as you are, flaws and all, and boundaries are really healthy and really important. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, I mean, I know I'm still working on that for myself, you know, like I am, can be my own worst enemy at times. And, and I think all of us totally. can be. and um, knowing that we are enough is definitely, you know, a great reminder. Yeah. Um, so my third question is what's the essential part of your daily routine? I would say, well, besides coffee, cause I can't <laughs> exist without coffee. Um, it's really important for me every day to get outside, rain or shine. Um, I really find a lot of stillness and I can really hear myself when mm -hmm. I am outside, even if it's just five minutes of just being present to nature. And I think that's a really important part of my daily living. Yeah. 
no, it's so healthy. And, you know, I always say we get distracted with all the things going on. We're in a very busy world. And so it's always good to like find time to connect with yourself to, you know, recharge yourself, um, you know, get balanced, get, you know, um, grounded is what I wanted to say too. So it's, it's always a good reminder. And I think the best way to do it is out in nature, in my opinion, you know? Um, so what's the best advice you've ever received? The best advice I have ever received, um, was to do less that was it. Do less. You do too much, do less. Yeah. And I, I think that that's a very relevant piece of advice for a lot of parents, especially because we are in a consumption culture. Mm-hmm. And so we're constantly reading and being fed ideas. I know because I'm part of it. I'm providing ideas online. Um, but yet when we consume and consume and consume, we think we have to do all these things at one time. And then we become very overwhelmed and we forget to listen to our intuition and mm-hmm. our inner knowing. And we think that in order to be enough, I have to do all these things. So do less, be more, maybe is what I would say. Oh, that's great advice. I love that. Do you have any last words uh, before for the audience before we part ways? Well, if they want to connect with me, they can on um, Instagram at Conscious Mommy. And um, you can check out all of my workshops at learning.consciousmommy.com. Perfect. And I will have all the links below in the show notes. And so you can contact her and be the best parent that you can be. And uh, thank you so much for coming on. It was such an honor and hopefully look forward to talking to you again. Thank you, Christina. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Not Your Mama's Podcast. If you're enjoying the show, please feel free to rate, subscribe, and leave a review wherever you listen to your podcasts. We really appreciate it, and we'll see you in the next one.